Aloha, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Thinking Things Through, Thinking Critically in Critical Times. I'm your host, Michael Sukoff. Today, we're going to discuss the theme and purpose of this show. And we're going to be doing that through a consideration of what it means to think critically. And before I go any further, I just want to say that um, this is the fifth show we've done. And except for perhaps the first show, I haven't really gone into a whole lot of detail about what it means to think critically and and therefore what the intent and purpose of this show is. So um, today we're going to uh, talk about and consider questions like, what is critical thinking? What does it mean to think critically? And what does this look like in the real world? Uh, secondly, what's the relationship between being able to think critically and being a citizen in an allegedly democratic society such as our own? And finally, why is the ability to think critically absolutely essential if we are, are to have a truly democratic society? So we've got a lot to cover. Uh, we may not cover it all. Um, and finally, what I'd like to get to at the end of the show or toward the end is discuss what all this means for us as citizens of Hawaii and, and the United States. What are some of the existing barriers or obstacles might be to creating a truly democratic society and political culture and what we can do to bring such a society about. So uh, before we get into all of this, what I thought I would do first is read an excerpt from a book uh, from many years ago. It was actually published in 1968 in this country by R.D. Lang, who was a famous British uh, psychologist and psychoanalyst. And the reason why I'm going to read this, I think it, it exemplifies someone who is thinking critically about the world. So, uh, excuse me, I may have to look down briefly just to read this excerpt, but. So here we go. The name of the book is The Politics of Experience. Uh, few books today are forgivable. Lack on the canvas, silence on the screen, an empty white sheet of paper are perhaps feasible. There is little conjunction of truth and social reality. Around us are pseudo events to which we adjust with a false consciousness, adapted to see these events as true and real, and even as beautiful. In the society of, it says men here, but of course I'm including men and women, the truth resides now less in what things are than in what they are not. Our social realities are so ugly if seen in the light of exiled truth and beauty is almost no longer possible if it is not a lie. Well, let me just stop there for a moment. Um, what this paragraph I just quoted to me exemplifies is, is someone who is seeing the world around him, but not taking what he sees for granted. In other words, he says there is little conjunction of truth and social reality. Now this, this phrase really hits home for me, given what we've been going through and experiencing in this country for the last few years. We've got this whole uh, de debate about uh, post-truth, what is truth, um, what is reality? And, you know, we're constantly hit with displays of pseudo events on the screen. In other words, through our, through our mass media, you know, we watched the uh, January 6th um, insurrection and, but we're all experiencing, we all experience seeing that as media, mediated as seen through our television sets or our smartphones or our computers. So already, uh, we're not experiencing the event itself, but we're experiencing uh, images of that event. And then, of course, the way we see or saw that event is very much molded by how we already see the world, how we understand what we're looking at, 
and also particularly how these events are framed and interpreted interpreted for us for us and explained by pundits and uh, news folks on MSNBC, CNBC, uh, NBC, all, all of these uh, sources of mass media. And I just want to skip to this last sentence from R.D. Lang. Um, he, 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 he says that our discouragement about all these things and, and about not being able to really understand the world anymore because it's so complex, he says, quote, this mood is already dated, at least insofar as it is not a perennial possibility of the human spirit. This possibility entails a sense of time, which is already being dissolved in the instantaneous, stochastic, abrupt, discontinuous electronic cosmos, the dynamic mosaic of the electromagnetic field. Unquote. So even back in 1968, before the internet and a lot of the, the advances in, in media and technology that we now take for granted, he was already seeing the problem with the mass media and the virtual world and the internet and how that was, the precursors to that were already affecting the way we saw and thought about the world in front of us. So um, before getting into um, the, the meat of the show, I thought it would be important for me just to share a little bit more about my own personal background experiences and interests, as well as what has brought me to become interested in these issues and thus to uh, host this show. So very briefly, uh, I was born and grew up at the beginning of what is now referred to as the atomic age. In other words, the early 1950s, when the first nuclear weapons were tested and exploded. Uh, I'm sorry, of course, there was the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and, Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II, 1945, which was really the dawn of the nuclear age. Um, but I, so I grew up at, at the, the first few years of the atomic age. And this immediately affected the way I saw the world. I had a father who taught me by example to think about and question what was going on in the world. Um, you know, I was very much aware of the uh, racism and violence in the south, southern United States that was happening during that time. Um, my father took me on civil rights marches as a very young boy. And then what I remember clearly uh, that really shaped in a, in, a, in a major way who I am today was my experience of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And for our younger viewers and listeners who weren't around then or have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, after World War II, uh, in which the United States and its allied countries and what was then the Soviet Union, were victorious, uh, began a, an arms race, a, a military cold war between the Western powers, including the United States and uh, the Soviet Union, which is now Russia, but the Soviet Union and its allied uh, republics, as well as some countries in Eastern Europe, there was, a, there was an arms race to see who could develop the most advanced, most destructive weapons first. And um, but anyway, skipping ahead to 1962, uh, the Soviet Union, which is now Russia, uh, installed nuclear capable missiles in Cuba, uh, which, is, which is and was a country only 90 miles from, from the US coastline, from, from Florida. And when that came into the public consciousness and it was covered on the media, uh, there were 10 days there where things were so uh, ramped up between the uh, Soviet Union and the United States, it 
it was possible that nuclear weapons could have been used. And I was 10 years old at the time and it, it, it scared the living daylights out of me because I understood what the implications would be. And that changed my consciousness in a very fundamental way at that young age. Um, so all these things that I've been describing contributed to the beginnings of my being, being able to think critically about things in the world. And what I mean by thinking critically is questioning what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing on television or on the radio, not just accepting what's being presented to me and learning how to ask deeper questions about what I was seeing and hearing. And of course, I had the advantage of being able to talk to, to my parents about these things. Um, so anyway, now I'm gonna skip to my early college years. I went to the University of California at Berkeley as an undergraduate. And at the time I got there, which was not until 1972, but it still felt like the 1960s. And what I mean by the phrase the 1960s is in this country, in the United States, and also in many other countries around the world, there were massive uh, protest movements, uh, first of all, um, against racism and discrimination in, in the Southern United States. And then soon, uh, once the United States government and military be became involved in what was a civil war in Vietnam between North Vietnam and South Vietnam, um, once that started to happen, I was in high school, I became of, of draft age. There was a military draft in the United States at that time, and I had to register for it. And so I had to decide what I would do because I already did not believe that the war that the United States was waging in Vietnam was a just war. I thought it was, um, a, it was wrong. Many innocent Vietnamese were being killed and bombed. And, and of course, once the United States uh, introduced troops there in massive numbers, many young men that were close to my age were coming home in body bags. And this was all over t television. Um, so uh, this all affected my, my, the way I thought about the world. And that was, these were the roots of my own thinking critically in the world. And there were other things that affected that uh, in, in the subsequent years. So I just wanted to share a little bit with, with, with our viewers and listeners about my own personal history and background and what in many ways has led me to, to do this show. So um, skipping ahead very quickly now, and I, I just wanna mention that um, because um, I don't have a guest today on this show, uh, if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask me during the course of this show, um, please do send them to the email address that's on your screen now, and I will become aware of them and I will be happy to take them and answer them during the course of the rest of this show. So what is critical thinking? Um, there are many different meanings for the term critical. As uh, one of my previous guests noted uh, about a month ago, critical uh, relates to the word critique. It also relates to the word criticism. And both those, both those terms can have you know, several different meanings. There's also uh, the word critical to criticize, as in criticizing someone or something. So I, I'm, I'm mentioning all these different meanings of the term critical because I want to uh, be clear about how I'm using the term. What do I mean when I say critical thinking? So when I'm using the term critical or critical thinking, I'm largely using it in the context of a type of thinking or theory that came out of largely uh, Germany in the early 1920s. 
uh, there was a, a tradition of philosophical thought that became called critical theory. And that tradition originated with a certain group of thinkers in Germany in the early 1920s. I'll mention two or three names, but I don't expect many, if not most of uh, our viewers and listeners to ever have heard of them. Theodor Adorno, Max Horkheimer, Herbert Marcuse, uh, Walter Benjamin. The, the basic characteristics of this type of thinking, uh, and I'm just gonna summarize this briefly, are the following. The ability to think holistically. And what, what I mean by that is a person's ability to see the whole, the big picture, the big picture behind whatever they're looking at, thinking about, or talking about. For example, in relationship to the current Russian invasion and war against Ukraine, we need to see the bigger picture. And what I mean by that is not just seeing what's in front of our faces right now, not just seeing the daily reports of uh, killing, atrocities in Ukraine, how people are suffering there, but we need to be able to step back and see the bigger picture of how did we get here in the first place? Uh, how did things get to the point where Russia felt the need to invade the country, the sovereign country of Ukraine? What were the historical events that led up to this? So thinking critically also involves the ability to think historically. In other words, to be able to understand the relationships among and between the events and actions that preceded what we may be experiencing or witnessing right now through our through our media and as as those things are interpreted by pundits and uh, political figures and so forth. Uh, the third main uh, uh, aspect of of critical thinking in this in this sense is for me, the ability to question statements of fact. In other words, uh, when we're told that um, attacks on our Capitol building in January of 2021 were threats to our democracy, that's, that, that phrase is presented as, it's, as a fact, our democracy. But as, as citizens of an informed democratic society and culture, we need to be able to not just accept those statements at face value, we need to be able to understand what's being said and ask questions like, what is democracy? What does it mean to call it our democracy? There are a lot of assumptions in statements like that we, that we don't ordinarily question because um, we're certainly not taught how to question these kinds of statements and assertions uh, in our, in our dem democratic society. I would argue as an educator and teacher for many years, I don't see a whole lot of evidence uh, from the students that I've taught. Of course, I don't, uh, I don't, nor I have not normally gotten to have students until they were in their first or second year of undergraduate college, but I see very little evidence that they've ever been taught how to think critically with, with, with a few exceptions, of course. Um, so these are the main points I wanted to raise for uh, discussion today. Critical thinking, critical theory. Well, um, in relationship to today's, what's going on in today's world, I believe and think, feel very strongly that unless we as citizens of the United States and of Hawaii can start to question some of the things that are being communicated to us, either through our political leaders, through our uh, media outlets, uh, through the internet, that we have very little chance of actually 
contributing to what our democracy is supposed to be all about. And what I mean by that is, is the following. Um, we've got racism and discrimination, uh, police killings of African Americans and others. And this has really come to the fore in, in our public consciousness through our media, especially since May of 2020, which was when George Floyd was murdered. And we very soon became aware of that, if, if many of us weren't already aware, and many of us were, that um, police killings of African Americans have been going on uh, almost since the inception of, of the United States, although at that time there, there was nothing called uh, police per se. We may have had uh, the, the remnants of the Continental Army and uh, state and state militias and so forth. But to think critically about these kinds of issues means asking questions about, wait a minute, why is this happening? Why has there been a pattern of killings of African Americans and other uh, racial minority groups in this country going back 75, 80, 90 years or more? To think critically is to start asking questions about when we see a pattern like this, how do we understand it? And I'm, I'm sure I'm saying some things that are probably quite controversial to some members of, of our audience. And um, uh, I realize that, and um, I'm happy to hear other points of view or questions that might question what I'm saying. But the whole point of what I'm saying today and of this show is to get us to start thinking more deeply, more critically, about what's going on in, the world, on in the world or in our neighborhood, in our island, in Hawaii, and in the world at large. Because um, being able to think critically is an essential part of what it means to be able to be an informed citizen in a democratic society. And if we don't have the ability to do that, we're really in trouble. So um, let me switch gears now because I don't want to end on a, a negative uh, note. Uh, I want to, us to think about what can we do as citizens to empower ourselves to be more informed and therefore to participate in the, the, the processes of decision making in our political system, in our neighborhoods, in our communities to make our, our state, our island, our country and the world a better place and, and to really understand what it means to bring values of democracy and freedom and justice to our country and to the world at large. So I guess I'm going to, to stop with this. Um, I, I hope we can, we can have some more discussions uh, on future shows that would address some of these questions. And I certainly encourage everybody who's watching and listening to please communicate with me with this program, um, not just through sending questions that you see on your screen, but through contacting me directly and I'm gonna give my email address. Uh, I'm going to say it, and then I'm gonna spell it very slowly. So again, uh, I'll do that in a moment uh, because this is basically uh, gonna be all the time we have for today. This has been Thinking Things Through, Thinking Critically in Critical Times on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Michael Sukop. Please do join us again two weeks from today at the same time, wherever you may be. and. To contact me, my email address is, it's three words. First word is Hawaii, H-A-W-A-I-I. -I. 
Second word is is, I, S. And the third word is calling, C-A-L-L-I-N-G. So my email address is Hawaii is calling at gmail.com. If there's any way of putting that up on the screen, there we go. Thank you so much to our, to our engineer for doing that. Please feel free to email me and I'll be happy to respond. And I will certainly take in consideration whatever you have to say, whether, whether it's criticism, support, encouragement, um, or suggestions for future shows. I will definitely take your whatever you have to share with me seriously, and I will try to respond to as many of your emails as I can. Okay, thank you very much for joining us today on Thinking Things Through. Thanks to our engineers, to Jay Fidel and uh, Haley Akeda and the rest of the Think Tech team in our studios in downtown Honolulu. Mahalo and uh, aloha to you all. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.